Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at Portland State University. I, my name is Leming Wang. I'm co-hosting the seminar with Professor Kelly Clifton this term. Uh, today, we're, we're pleased to have uh, two select teams of uh, Masters of Urban and Regional Planning students to present their project from their planning workshop. Uh, one on the Green Loop project in Portland, the other is slow, the Slow Mo in Moser, Oregon. Uh, I will let the team introduce, or the presenter introduce themselves and the team member in a little bit. Uh, we'll begin with the Green Loop project and then we'll, uh, the, the other team will, will take turn after that. We'll hold the question and answer to the end. Okay. Uh, with that, I will just turn over to Jake for the Green Loop project. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jake Adams, and I'm representing the uh, Green Loop Southwest PDX project for the uh, Masters of Urban and Regional Planning Workshop team. Uh, just a quick uh, overview. This is my team here. Uh, Brian Gunn, Kate Washington, myself, Ashley Eaton, and Mohammed Mediensha. Great team. We've done a lot of work together. I've been really proud to work with these folks. Um, our clients have been the Urban Design Studio at the Bo Portland Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for Portland City and the Campus Planning Office for PSU. So today I'm going to cover uh, what the Green Loop is, who it's for, uh, or excuse me, what the Green Loop is, what we've done to kind of figure out what the current conditions are, who we're targeting with the Green Loop as kind of our target audience, and finally what our recommendations are for the city to really make the Green Loop something really special. So first, the Green Loop. What is this thing? The Green Loop concept came out of the city's West Quadrant plan that uh, was recently adopted by the city council. The basic idea here is that it's a 10 mile uh, linear park, pedestrian trail, uh, bicycle trail, through the heart of downtown Portland, connecting both the east and west sides of the, of the city. Uh, it takes advantage of the new Tilikum Crossing that's opening in September to connect these two sides. Now, the city's already got the uh, East Bank Esplanade and the Waterfront Trail that kind of form this inner loop. The Green Loop is meant to be an outer loop that uh, really goes further into the retail core and the central east side district to really uh, bring people closer to the destinations and the districts that they really want to visit. Our study area it has been the southwest portion of the Green Loop, hence our name. Um, we've been looking at connecting from the Tilikum Crossing all the way up to the end of the South Park blocks. Uh, this includes the Portland State Campus, the South Park blocks, the uh, area surrounding the University Place Hotel, as well as the southwest waterfront around the International School and the Collaborative Life Science Building. So we focused on four main goals. First is safety. This covers both personal safety, do I feel safe walking this area or do I think I'm going to get mugged, as well as physical safety. Do, is this a safe place to walk without getting run over or is this a safe place to bike without being hit? Our next goal is the environment. A large reason for the Green Loop has come out of the city's um, uh, but up, but up, uh, climate action plan, which has a very ambitious goal for reducing carbon emissions. And one way we can do this is by decreasing the uh, drive mo driver mode share and increasing active transportation mode share. Beyond this, we also have kind of local, regional, uh, local uh, environment goals to improve the environment around the trail itself and around the, mo the uh, nodes that we've identified. Our third goal is identity. We really want the Green Loop to be an iconic structure for the city, as well as be easily identifiable where you should go and where other amenities are. Finally, efficiency. Um, the Green Loop, Green Loop should be the most direct and easily traversable route from point A to point B. This is very important for pedestrians and cyclists as detours cost a lot more when you're biking or walking than they do when you're driving. So that's the Green Loop. When you're doing a plan, you really need to have a really good idea for what's on the ground, what your existing context is that you're planning within. 
So to do this, we conducted both uh, initial conditions analysis as well as some public engagement process to find out what people want. So our uh, existing conditions analysis composed of several, uh, several strategies and tactics. We did uh, uh, an analysis of the demographics of the census tracts around PSU, the South Waterfront, and the Southwest Park Blocks to really find out what are, what's the population like immediately adjacent to our, uh, our section. We did walkability audits using an instrument that is supported by academic research to really give us a number that we can compare block to block and say, oh, this, this group, this block over here is doing really well. This area over here, that could really use some help. We did bicycle and pedestrian counts because it's very important not only to know kind of what the current uh, usage is of the area, but now the city can go back in five years after the Green Loop has been built and say, oh man, we really, inter we really increased biking and walking in this area, or hmm, what can we do over here to make it even better? We're kind of lacking in this area. So it really sets a baseline for the city. Third, uh, we also conducted parking counts. These were both automobile parking counts and bicy bicycling parking counts of the spaces available uh, on street parking and then bike parking. Uh, usually uh, bike staples, the very standard Portland uh, bike staple. And finally, we did a business inventory to really get a feel for what businesses are around here and who could benefit from this green loop, who could benefit or who might be uh, impacted by removal of parking. So a couple things to note here. Um, one, when we looked at the demographics, we looked at the mode share of travel to work from people in these areas to their workplaces. And what was really interesting was that while walking was the most popular mode choice, biking had only a 1% mode share in this area, which indicates that we ha might have a chance here to put a facility in that will really help people get out and bike more. Um, when it came to the bike counts, one of the interesting things we found was we did a count on the new cycle track on Southwest Moody next to the Collaborative Life Science Building. This uh, location saw the highest number of bikers by far in any of our count locations, but it also was the only place where the male to female ratio was even close to parity. Most areas had a two or three or even four to one male to female ratio. So this really shows us the benefit of really good infrastructure. So one of the last things, uh, on our, uh, oh, hold that thought. So going over to our public engagement. Um, now it's really important when you're planning to not say, oh, we made this great plan, you're gonna love it and hand it to people. But you really want to be planning with the people, not for the people. The purpose of planning is to help people improve their in, uh, their lives by improving their built environment. And this isn't something you can do just top down. You really have to work with people. To do this, we conducted uh, 18 different interviews with stakeholders. These ranged from neighborhood groups to bicycle and pedestrian advocates to uh, city agencies, PSU, OHSU, really anyone who would talk to us. And quite frankly, we were rather floored at how many people really wanted to talk to us. It was great. Uh, we also conducted an online visual preference survey so we could ask people, what do you want in this area? Of these images, which do you like best? Why? How will this really help you in getting around? And we had over 350 responses to this survey. It was great. Finally, we went out to several public events. We tabled at the farmer's market. We went to several neighborhood meetings to reach out and find out what, what do people in these areas want? What are they really concerned about? A couple of key points that came out of our public engagement strategy uh, was that separated facilities really are a must for people in this area, both separating uh, uh, pedestrians from cyclists and cyclists from cars. Now the engineers in the room will tell you that it's not speed that kills, it's the speed differential. So when you've got uh, cyclists going their walking pace, or excuse me, pedestrians going walking pace, cyclists going a little bit quicker and cars going even bit even faster in the same space is just a recipe for disaster. So there really needs to be some sort of physical, uh, vertical separation between these modes. Um, next was that bike parking is a key concern. In this area, from our uh, existing conditions report, we saw that really the only bike parking available is the Portland staple. PSU has some bike parking garages, but those are limited to uh, students, faculty, and uh, 
employees of the school. So not anybody just visiting for the day can come use those. So secure bike parking is key. Finally, for our survey, we asked people, how comfortable do you feel dining downtown, walking downtown, or going to a movie, or enjoying uh, green spaces? And for all these things, people felt incredibly comfortable. The one thing they didn't feel comfortable doing downtown was biking. It was a real outlier in our survey. So this shows that you know, maybe we need a new facility downtown. Maybe we need something that will increase biking. So this leads us to the question of who are we making this facility for? Uh, to evaluate this, we really looked at Roger Geller's four types of cyclists. Now, if you're not familiar with these four types of cyclists, uh, there's the strong and fearless group. This is the group, they'll take the lane. They don't really feel a need for any additional infrastructure. They're pretty confident, pretty uh, uh, comfortable in just about any condition. The next group is the enthused and confident group. This group would prefer infrastructure, but is OK taking the lane or navigating a difficult connection between existing facilities. The big group here is the interested but concerned group. This is about 60% of the uh, population, according to research. And they, are, uh, they have an interest in cycling, but they're a little scared or a little uncomfortable with the current conditions. Um, we've seen a lot on the news just this last week of uh, bicycle accidents, um, really a need to make the place safe for this group. Finally, the no way, no how group is about a third of the population, and for whatever reason, uh, physical limitations are just a lack of desire, and that's totally okay, don't want a bike. So we're targeting the interested but concerned group. Now when you look at some of the research that's been done, this group responds really well to uh, increased infrastructure. If you look here, this is uh, how comfortable do you feel biking in a kind of a normal arterial? What if it had a bike lane? And what if that bike lane had physical protection, based off of a survey by uh, Jennifer Dill and Nathan McNeil? So this group responds really well, and that's the group we're targeting. So now that we know what the Green Loop is, uh, what, where it will be, uh, the existing conditions in which it will be built, and who it's for, let's look at what the city can do to really make this a great facility. The first thing we looked at was alignment. Uh, originally, this was a little bit outside our scope, but as we got into it and looked at it, we realized we really need to have an idea of where this might go to make the right recommendations. We came up with three alternatives, uh, alternative A, alternative B, and C, alternative C. A is very much a on the ground, let's implement this as quickly and easily as possible while still getting a high standard, high quality facility. The one trade-off on this, however, is uh, the safety aspect. It goes underneath the Markham Bridge ramps, and that area is a very, lacks a lot of natural surveillance. It can be very dark, and there aren't a whole lot of eyes on the street down there. It also goes down Southwest Lincoln, which recently had the uh, streetcar, excuse me, light rail tracks added. And tracks are a big concern to that interested but concerned group as well. Uh, alternative B trades safety for a little bit of a detour. You can see it jogs a little bit, but this creates a safer route. Finally, alternative C is our go for gusto route. This is shoot for the moon. This involves capping I-405 and putting the, free, putting the green loop on top of, the, of this cap and then creating a ramp or flyover from the end of the cap to the existing infrastructure on uh, Southwest Moody. So when we looked at these alternatives based on our four goals of safety, identity, efficiency, and the environment, plus timeliness, because really the city wants something in the next five years if possible, we said, C really hits all these boxes except timeliness. Um, the freeway cap is under the discretion of ODOT and is subject to their funding and their timeline and a lot of other constraints that just make this not very feasible in the, in the short term. So we came up with a three-phase uh, implementation plan. Phase one is to put alternative B on the ground. This will give the city a high-class, high-quality facility. Phase two is to create the uh, flyover and ramp or elevator connecting NATO and Southwest Moody, which will make a more direct connection for alternative B, but will also lay the ground for phase three, which is to implement the cap and put the green loop on top of the cap. So finally, now that we've built the green loop, what should it be, or now that we've identified where the green loop should go, what should it be um, 
built out of? What, what are our general recommendations? For personal safety, we recommend following the basic tenets of crime prevention through environmental design. Uh, and the most important thing here is consistent lighting. Uh, it's important to note that consistency is more important than intensity. It doesn't matter how bright it is, if there's a dark spot that your eyes can't see because they're used to super bright lighting and now you have no idea what's in the shadows. For physical safety, this goes back to our re uh, public engagement and also the research that shows that physically separated facilities are the most comfortable for the widest uh, range of users. So physically separating uh, pedestrians from cyclists and then cyclists from automobiles. For placemaking, we really want the Green Loop to be a place with a capital P. Now, that's very difficult to do along the whole loop, but by identifying certain nodes where we can focus on, we can really create a place. And the goal here is to use the rule of 10. Each place should have 10 different things or different activities, 10 different reasons to be there. Now, this could be very difficult to achieve. That's a lot of things to do in a lot of areas, but it's a good goal to shoot for. For wayfinding, it should be very easy to know where you are on the Green Loop and where other destinations are. For example, the art museum is five minute right ahead, or uh, this other trail is right over here. And the Green Loop should have a consistent identity. You should know when you're on the Green Loop. Green infrastructure goes beyond just adding more trees or more planters and gets into stormwater management and green walls. If you look at the south wall of the Ondine housing complex on Southwest College, right now you'll note it's just a giant uh, blank cement wall. This is a really great opportunity to add a green wall here to really uh, liven the place up and make it feel a much more comfortable and inviting space. Finally, you know a city is serious about a project when it assigns funds and planning for the continued maintenance of that project and doesn't just let it go to pot. Towards this end, we recommend that the city work with friends of groups, either existing friends of groups like the Friends of the South Park Locks, or create a new Friends of the Green Loop project to really give the city, uh, excuse me, give the community ownership of the project. Then it's their Green Loop and not just the city's Green Loop, and it's much more likely to be self-enforced. So, with all these general recommendations, what do we get? We get something like this, but better. This is the Indianapolis Cultural Trail in uh, Indianapolis, obviously. And we want this, but we want to go even better, addressing both cyclists and pedestrians and really create something the city can be proud of. Just like to make a quick shout out to our clients at BPS and the Campus Planning Office, our faculty advisors, Cy Adler, Marisa Zapata, and our practitioner in residence, Susan Gibson Harnett, who really helped us out with a lot of uh, questions and stuff we had early on. I'd like to thank our stakeholders that we interviewed and the many, many people who took our survey. We are blown away by the response rate. Finally, we'd like to thank our family and friends who've stood by us through, by us through this very long process of six months or so. And I guess, super finally, uh, all y'all for listening and the uh, seminar for having us today. Thank you. Great job, Jake. That looks like a great project. I am impressed. <laughs> Let me get this pulled up for you all. All right. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hey, thanks for being here and allowing me to share the slow-mo plan with you. Uh, my name is Neil Heller, and the slow-mo plan is a MERP workshop uh, project that spans two terms. And these MERP workshop projects are selected via an RFP process. And so our group chose to work in the city of Mosier, Oregon. And so what I want to do today is just sort of explore, describe the project to you, um, explore our inputs, and then share our recommendations. Um, so who are we? We're a team of six planning students with various backgrounds and interests. Uh, we chose to call ourselves Kaleidoscope. Because when you think of a, like a kid's toy kaleidoscope, there are many moving parts that create an image. And then if one of those pieces change, well, it changes the whole image. And so we kind of thought that was appropriate for this planning process, managing the uh, uh, visions and values of, of various groups. So 
Uh, from left to right, we have Matt Lee, Randy Campbell, who was nice enough to join me here today. Uh, we have Kathy Wilson, Amanda Davidowitz, who is also joining us today, uh, Liz Caster, and then myself, Neil Heller. Um, so let me get you all oriented. The, as I mentioned, we're working with the city of Mosier. Mosier is a small town of 433 people. It is in the Columbia River Gorge. It's 70 miles from downtown Portland and five miles from Hood River. And just like all Gorge towns, they share similar opportunities, but also similar challenges. Um, they have access to nature, access to the river, access to recreation. Um, but Mosier, it has unique opportunities and challenges, such as its proximity to Hood River, um, which um, is a population base for the gorge, and so they can, there's a trail that connects Hood River to Mosier, so there's opportunity for that. But there's also challenges being so close to Hood River is that they absorb a lot of the energy and tourism that goes to that area, so. Um, our project focused on a half mile stretch of Highway 30, and Highway 30 is the historic highway that was built through the gorge in the 30s. Um, that runs through the town. In addition, we took a look at, is this the pointer? Yeah, we looked at the um, portion of the highway that connects, so the historic highways that go through the gorge, some parts have been demolished for the um, implementation of I-84, or the construction of it, and then other parts uh, are still traveled by vehicles, and then some parts are being restored to pedestrian uh, multi-use paths. Um, so why is this important? Why is this little stretch of highway in this little tiny town important? Um, there, there are regional plans uh, looking to promote recreational and tourism opportunities using this historic highway. There's a plan called the Gorge Town to Trails, and this, these are walking paths uh, where you can walk from town to town through the gorge, stay in campgrounds, stay in yurts. Um, there's also a plan called the Gorge Bike Hubs, and that is a, a bicycle loop through the gorge, the Oregon and the Washington side. Uh, with that would have bike rest stops in each town, and each of the rest stops would have their own um, character that reflects the character of the community itself. Um, so this kind of shares with you, um, illustrates what my team's been working on for the last five months, and you can see that we have, it moves along at a pretty quick little pace. Um, so initially, to start the project there in the scope of work, uh, we met with the city manager and the mayor of Mosier to develop the goals of the project. And as you can see here, the uh, project goals are to create a shared street, a community centerpiece, and that would contribute to a thriving downtown. And we also were looking at how does that trail connect into town. Um, it's a very popular trail. But ultimately, though, the purpose of the overall document, that plan, is to define a collective community vision and to create an advocacy document for the town as they go forward to apply for funding um, and work with future design consultants. And currently, they, I have, I believe, just submitted their application for the TGM, Transportation Growth Management Fund. So we're hoping to hear back positive things on that. So as I mentioned, working with all these, you know, the kaleidoscopic view, working with all these different shareholders. Um, so after the, we developed these project goals, it was time to then gather community and stakeholder input to see how they envision the future of this portion of the highway. And this is the part where there's really a lot of opportunity for, for learning as students. Um, learning how, where you're six people that have never worked together, you're developing your internal process, um, your inter individual roles, and then you're going out to the community and you're working with all these types of people that have their own vision and ideas of what should happen, and then you have got to take all that and put it together. Um, so, interesting process. Um, so then, we reached out to the local community, and so opportunities for community input uh, happened through a survey, a design workshop, an open house, and there was even a couple of us that went out and did some door-to-door -door knocking um, to reach the residents in, at their homes. But really, we defined for this process, in this project, we defined the community as anyone that lives, works, or interacts with Mosier in some way on a regular basis. So there are some people that live here in Portland, but they own a home in Mosier, or there are cyclists that bike often uh, into Mosier. And so we wanted to hear from them as well. 
So engaging the community revealed certain key findings in that are uh, more places that encourage social interaction, better ped pedestrian linkages, and more shared streets. So it's important to note that, note the high turnout at this community design workshop, about 90 people. So 90 people in Mosier is equivalent to 126,000 Portland people. <laughs> or in other words, six sold out Trailblazer games. So they're a very engaged group of people. So other inputs include uh, developing an existing conditions report. And this image shows you some of the funky character of the town. Um, there, in addition to this, there's other pieces of art scattered throughout town in random places. Um, really interesting little place. And it's for such a small town, it's super funky, and it's not junky. <laughs> Um, but the main thoroughfare through town does not reflect that character. Notice these wide gravel shoulders. And you can imagine if your kids are hanging around downtown and you don't know if you've got a truck that's going to park there or are you supposed to walk here, where do you bike, right? So um, in addition to the existing conditions, we implemented a walkability index. And I was happy to see that the Green Loop did something similar. Um, because what that does is it gives you an objective way to see what's working and what's not. Um, the walkability index that we used was developed by new urbanist traffic engineer Rick Hall. Um, but what it does is it scores items based on uh, block length. So Mosier has really short blocks, which contributed to its score. Um, the lane widths, spatial enclosure, um, the height to width ratio, and Mosier had a f experienced a fire a while back, and they never were able to rebuild in their downtown, so that contributed poorly to their walkability, um, but also the, just the presence of bike ped facilities. And so here's me out measuring the block length from center line to center line with Matt. Uh, but overall, Mosier scored a 43 out of 100, resulting in just basic walkability. Um, so let me go over some of our outputs. So all of our inputs that we gathered, all the uh, stakeholder input, uh, the Historic Highway Commission, the regional traffic engineers, and also the feedback from the community engagement events, um, led to the creation of a new cross-section for this stretch of highway. And one that we feel will uh, create a place more in line with the values of the community and stakeholders, and ultimately moving them closer to their, their goals um, that they see um, are, are changing currently. Um, but so the existing cross-section, as you can see, if you remember from the picture, it has 12-foot travel lanes and super wide asphalt or gravel or grass shoulders. Um, and we propose reducing those lanes down to 10 feet, uh, implementing bike and ped facilities, uh, on-street parking to have controlled uh, parking access. Uh, currently, it's just kind of wide open. And so one of the mottos of the project partway through became uh, taking Mosier from free-range cars to free-range kids. Because so, currently, you could pr likely drive a vehicle and not stay on the highway through town. Um, so we also introduced some vegetation for that can uh, offer shade and stormwater functionality. So let me share with you kind of this overall design concept. Uh, what do we... So it proposes a fence keeping with the historic highway guidelines that reflects the historic highway character as well as the rural nature of the town itself. Um, it also introduces bike ped facilities, which we saw in the cross section. Um, some of the details even is we proposed some tighter curb radii. Uh, currently, I think that you could take this corner pretty quick and you could slice that. There's also an ice cream shop right here where kids hang out but you can slice that corner pretty quick. So um, we looked at um, controlling some of those. And then I mentioned the parking access. But we had two big moves for this whole project, and that is an intersection reconfiguration and implementing a shared street concept. And so we can kind of zoom into those, and I can show you those. So the existing configuration uh, has zero pedestrian crossing and allows for a higher speed vehicular m movement as they just kind of take that, just kind of veer off here. This is also adjacent to the school 
uh, I guess the school's here. And this is the route that the children take when they go out to the river or go up to the trail on a field trip. Um, so we proposed reconfiguring this intersection, creating uh, slow returning movements, and this crossing becomes much more visible as this intersection gets moved eastward to increase the sight distance for vehicles exiting the interstate. Um, that's not supposed to say intersection reconfiguration. That's supposed to say shared street. But this is an area that the community identified as having very high levels of activity. This is where most of the uh, current businesses exist. This is where most people hang out. But it's also the point that was um, had the highest safety concerns for the, by the community. So we suggested a shared street concept. And basically, uh, we look at a paving change that alerts drivers and, and bike cyclists to the high activity um, of the area. It uh, proposes bollards as well um, in, a, in the widening of the sidewalks. And, um, intersection paintings on the local streets. So in addition to the physical changes, we're also proposing programs that are intended to affect social change. Um, and these programs were chosen by the community at the community engagement events through a bucket voting system. Um, and then that resulted, so we proposed, had like nine or 11 or something like that. And so these are the top four that were chosen. A uh, Safe Routes to School program may having hosting Main Street events, uh, shared street marketing, uh, alerting cyclists and, and drivers and people to be aware and watch out for each other and share the road. And then also bike friendly businesses through Travel Oregon. Um, so I hope that you all get a chance to get out to the Mozone sometime <laughs> as these changes hopefully be, get implemented. Any questions for uh, um, either of us, but thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I had a question about the green loop. Did you guys uh, take into consideration the, at some point, up and coming bike share system? Yes, that's one of the uh, general overall program recommendations we make is that this does need to happen to get uh, to really help the Green Loop be used to its fullest, especially by uh, visiting uh, tourists and other people. Um, yes. <laughs> Short answer, yes. Um, I also have a question for Green Loop. Um, when you talk about uh, the demographics around the loop, what, co what kind of range are you talking Like, What did you define as kind of like that community for both the demographics and the business, I guess? The demographics were defined by census tracts 56 and 57, which encompass the uh, southwest waterfront and the university, the area around Portland State, and then also along the South Park blocks. For the businesses, we looked at anything directly adjacent to the proposed alignment. Lewis? Uh, this one's for Neil. Uh, with one of the year recommendations for doing uh, Main Street events, are you talking about posing the basically the state highway down or, or making, no? No, yeah, that would, that would remain open to freight traffic. There's a, it's a strong agricultural community, and so it's important that that stays open. I have a couple of voter questions. Yeah. Um, so um, one, one is, to, you know, if you want to encourage tourism, signage in Mosher is terrible. Yeah. It's difficult to find the trailhead for the historic highway, and to find that nice trail past the cemetery, you have to be in on the local secrets. Yes. So did you, did you talk about signage as part of the redesign? We did a little bit. We made, uh, in our recommendations, there's a few spots where we mentioned that their signage should be more visible. Um, yeah, and clear. And also, one, you know, what, how many of the agricultural interests, the freight interests, did, were involved in your conversations and how did they respond to the shared street idea? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, actually a really great question because the agricultural community is really difficult to, for us to reach. Um, we had a lot of engaged community uh, members, and there's also a Latino community that we were attempting to engage as well because they live directly adjacent, not all of them, but many, a high population live directly adjacent to the highway. 
Um, and so a lot of our effort went to reaching that population and some of the agricultural community, um, we could have possibly reached out and got more information, but we did get some feedback at the open house. Um, we had maybe four or five agricultural uh, people involved in agriculture kind of talk with us about some things, yeah. We had a lot of luck with smaller ads, so the owners of the Rack and Pop actually run a small organic farm and some organic orchards. They were at our event. The folks that dropped their food off at the Mojo Fruit Growers Association to get counted and laid for two months out of the year, it was really difficult to get a hold of them. They don't have a formalized organization in the office we could call. So it was um, with the, the lack of time and resources and the lack of city contact, pretty difficult to get those. And I'll say too, because this, this is definitely the big thing we've been reflecting on, and I spoke with our client last week about this, and she is just happy to have the vision kind of solidified in this document so that she has something to take, when because she has some better relationships with the uh, Fruit Growers Association, and um, one of our shared streets actually directly in front of the Mosher Fruit Growers Association building, so I'm sure they're going to have something to say. Their, their freight entrance is actually on the back end, and they have an, a ramp and like an open area that's on the other side that wouldn't be affected at all by the shared street, although it might be by the reconfiguration of the intersection. But um, she's very much looking forward to engaging with them directly through the TGM outreach process and have an next to secure the funding. And also the shared street concept isn't, we're not saying only put it here, we're saying as you all develop further, to decide where your to and from points of your downtown is, you can take this concept and pretty much move it anywhere along the way. Uh, just kind of building on that, uh, I noticed both projects, uh, to a certain extent, um, might require the state or really the state department of transportation to do something that they don't necessarily want to do and spend a lot of resources that they probably don't have, and they did, they wouldn't spend it on this, right? Um, but, I think, maybe. <laughs> but, that's the same reason, I guess. Like, uh, but I assume you agree with that premise. Uh, just kind of as a, as a pragmatist, how much did you think, okay, this is great, but this is going to sit somewhere for, I mean, how much of it you're saying, let's figure out what we can do without Captain you know, Highway? Or, I mean, how much of it, that's Captain Highway, it's great, yeah, okay, but that's not going to happen. So, how do you kind of balance, or we're not going to have next five years, how, yeah. how do you kind of balance that going forward about, you want to talk about these great things, but you don't want to, come up with a plan that's, you know, going to die at 101 today. Yeah. Um, we tried to approach that with our phased implementation alternative to really get our alternative B on the ground with something that is really great and achieves all the goals to some extent with an eye towards the future. Because you're right, capping that freeway is not a five-year project. Um, there is some momentum in that, well, you could kind of call it momentum. It's been talked about since the 70s. Um, so whether that's good momentum or bad momentum is up for debate, but that is one of the goals that was also put forth in the West Quadrant Plan along with uh, the Green Loop, not together, but those are both goals there. So this is something the community is definitely looking at, and uh, for our project, I really think the phased alternative, getting B on the ground, and then if you can implement the uh, phase two, which is the connection that would ultimately uh, end up with the end of the cap, that builds some momentum to say, hey, Let's really make this a great place once the cap gets implemented. Um, did you guys have any other similar issues? The so the shared street concept was probably our one recommendation that was sort of a bit of a sticking point for some of the traffic engineers and the historic highway commission, but it was a, something highly valued by the community. Um, so you know, you, how do you? balance these two conflicting ideals and values. So uh, that's something that is part of the, our recommendations for the community. And then as they go forward, it stays in the plan that they can then continue to have those conversations. Um, but the people working with the city of Mosier for the TGM grant funding are very positive um, and excited to see things happen in Mosier. So um, I think we're optimistic to see some change happen there. One of the things we did to really bolster our argument for the freeway cap is a lot of case studies about where it's already being done, where it has been done, how it got done, so that it, it's much easier for people who are reading the, the plan to refer to, oh yeah, Dallas is capping their freeway, and they did it this way. 
and things like that. So um, there's a lot of momentum already in the United States to make this happen. So it's easier when you can point to someone else who's already done it. And for our project, we engaged with ODOT through the entire process. So to ensure that we had a recommendation that was realistic. So um, that ensures that this could actually be implemented. It would be, it would be really careless of us to not do that. So we made sure. Um, so I've been working with Gert, I'm Gwen Shock. Um, I've been working with Better Block this term for our capstone project and the Better Digger project. And I know that Better Block is interested in doing the Green Loop as a potential project in the future. Would you guys, I mean, not like actually get, having you say anything, but would that be something that you guys would be interested in as like a step towards possible possible implementation, further implementation? Mm -hmm. Uh, we, are, we ended up talking with uh, one of the guys from Better Block after one of our meetings and had a lengthy conversation about how that could definitely be used as a tool to help uh, show the community, hey, look at how great this could be. Um, I think there are a couple points on the loop that that could be really beneficial for, yes. To add to that, we have a number of process recommendations going forth to our client and testing the concept with the Better Block cool. uh, thing is something that we proposed. Yeah, I know they would be interested. And I know that one of the things about is I've talked about with better block people is I know some of you guys were in the um, head and bike planning class in the fall and like having you guys and like Merce do that the planning stuff and then do it through capstone like see a engineering capstone and like make it just like a continuous thing to happen so I think that's really cool and both these projects are on that. Great question. Yeah yeah um, for the green loop uh, one of the, it was like the, one of the survey results for your public um, engagement was worried about anti-social behavior. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah, that didn't make sense, but so yeah. you know, elaborate it just a bit. Yeah. Um, my personal thought is that it's kind of a euphemism for homeless populations, panhandling, as well as uh, actual crime activities, drug use, etc. Um, that was one of the things that came out in our survey, yes. So I think that's the best way to describe that answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working on the Capstone project as well right now, and I'm the structural lead for what's going to be the on green wall and the concept. So just hearing you say that was really, really nice. Um, my question was, with your uh, plan C and plan B kind of phasing, you're going to uh, recommend a lot of big infrastructure changes to your plan B section, so along Lincoln, I guess it's along college and up through campus, um, and then potentially move forward, hopefully move forward to plan C, which is you know, an even bigger, kind of wider area uh, to implement. How do you view your kind of phasing as far as, um, I guess, uh, justifying in the investment? Cause, I mean, you know, Plan B is going to be expensive as well, as well as um, Plan B will be very expensive. So at what point do you kind of look at uh, your cost analysis and say, you know, which, which is really going to be feasible or which would be a good idea or how, how do you phase them in such a way where you're not spending a bunch of money and right. kind of, in a sense, abandoning it and moving forward and so on? Um, several of the sections, like this area on Southwest College, the city's already been looking at kind of trying to turn this into a green street. So this would uh, kind of two birds with one stone sort of idea. Uh, the second thought is that uh, the, from everything we've heard, the freeway capping project could be 20 or 30 years down the road. And by that point, you're going to hit the point of you need to in, uh, update the infrastructure already at that point. So it's really a sense of doing something right the first time with an eye towards uh, the future when you can really do something big. The, it doesn't hurt the city to have multiple good bike facilities. And so if you recognize the freeway cap comes with um, developable land, so people can build buildings on it, there will be restaurants on it, it will become a new piece of downtown, not just a park. And so it's, Portland's not going to hurt to have two really good bike facilities that serve downtown. And that's part of what, why we said this is okay to justify. Because we did think, you know, how do you justify the Green Loop? alignment fee to the city, to the people, and spend everyone's tax money on it, and then say, well, that was nice. 
three years later. Yeah, yeah but it's yeah. not going to be three years later. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be my children, you know, <laughs> who, are, who are building that. So we felt like because of the huge time frame, it was things were already going to come up for reinvestment, and it can be designed in a way that the city gets two really good facilities. One in the back. Um, so what's the grade on this flyover? It seems to me like it's be quite a prestigious grade for a lot of people who want to take it. Um, we didn't do an in-depth engineering analysis on this, but looking at the uh, looking at the site, uh, NATO is already above grade, above the freeway there, and then it would cross in between the two ramps that go from 405, so from southbound I-5 and northbound I-5. And so from what I can tell, and again, I'm a planner, not an engineer, uh, you should be able to do that with minimal arcing over that part. Um, the great change to get down from when you're up there down to Sheridan and Moody will re require some sort of large circular ramp or some sort of elevator similar to what's on Gibbs Street, that overpass now. Uh, uh, Lewis Kelly, a question for the Green Loop. Um, in, your, in the initial like al developing of your alternatives, um, did you look at any kind of retrofitting of the new Orange Line uh, flyover? Because I mean, that, like, the, the way the Tilcom Bridge just comes in there and then there's not, like, a good connection, you know, you can get to the waterfront, but then getting up that hill yeah. is, it seems like to me in that initial planning, like, a really missed opportunity. So I'm just wondering if, if you guys thought of that and, and looked at what was holding that back. Uh, I think, Ashley, do you want to? You described it as a missed opportunity, and that's how it was described to us, like a millions of dollars missed opportunity. There's... It's not feasible because that was our first thing. We're like, the max already goes there. Why not just get a nice facility that will complement that? And it's not wide enough. But it's just not feasible at all. It was a, it wasn't engineered to accommodate it. In fact, it was on the table to include the facility, and then it was removed from the budget. Yeah. And then they had an extra budget at the end. Yes. <laughs> it was just a missed opportunity, and it's not feasible, sadly. So. On the Green Loop, um, you just dealt with one segment. And did your client, like the city, you know, have any sense of prioritizing this this segment versus, for example, how you get a Green Loop through the Central East Side? You know, Green Loop yeah. through the Central East Side seems a little challenging. Yeah. So, was there, or were you just simply told, see what you can do with this segment and forget the rest of it? Our focus was definitely on this portion of the Green Loop. Um, um, yeah, the West Quadrant plan was just approved. So the Southeast Quadrant plan is being worked on right now. It should be approved later this summer, and it will refer to the alignment for the Southeast Quadrant, which will probably be a Merck project next year. Um, so, right, and many, many more. So I think it's just a matter of the plan was approved, so it was timely for this, and I think that um, it wor it's easier to work on here because uh, PSU is already proposing some changes to their South Park blocks, and so the city wants to get in on that before they get updated and changed, and then it's hard to work on that. And I'd say the city is actively working on, like, for example, they're doing a lot of work right now in the northwest section of, like, the design for that part of the Green Loop. And so we looked at the southwest section. We also had a lot of general recommendations in terms of wayfinding systems that would carry throughout the entirety of the loop. Two very different Anyone else? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Cheryl, um, what sort of placemaking additions did you devise for the um, green look that you think would really set it apart and make this an iconic Portland? I'm going to give that to Kate, who focused on that. <laughs> so we have some really neat ideas. So the basic premise of the Green Loop is, one, it's an active transportation route, but it also needs to be a place where there are places, where public places where people can be. And I think the way that I think about it is that when you're in the urban core, you spend 10 to 15 hours of your day in public. You're not at home. You're not in your home. You're either at an office or you're getting to your office or having lunch. And so we conceived of the places that could be along the Green Loop as places that need to accommodate daily needs. So we proposed 
you know, things like furniture where you can actually rest your laptop on it, not just on your lap. And um, charging stations would be really useful to have in public. And things like that. So we, we first conceive of it as there are, there are opportunities to help people live their lives in the urban core. And then we also conceive of, um, in the South Park blocks around the cultural district, uh, there's an op we recommend taking out the parking on the interior lanes, so that brings room to create more more room for places. Uh, we talked about updating the the playground area at the end of the South Park blocks to make that kind of more of a destination and a, and a capstone to a, to the South Park blocks. Um, there's a place making opportunity on Mito at uh, just west of the international school because the city owns that land along the street um, and if they're not going to sell it to international school then they can turn it into quite a park some kind of really beautiful place to pause uh, because there's already a lot of greenery and big mature trees and then the freeway cap opens up tons of opportunity for a, a huge variety of parks and um, we recommend a fitness court to be added so that people you know can exercise in the world not have to have a gym membership. Um, uh, an oasis park that has small nooks is a, is a quieter, more contemplative area. I think the least exciting thing she's forgetting though is this idea that like if you're looking at this aerial, like from an aerial view, can you see it? Um, if you think about the transit mall right now, Jake had pointed this out at one point. If you look on like Google imagery stats, Satellites, you can see very clear, like, this is the transit mall because of the orange bricks. So, so picking something that's going to be shown throughout the entire thing, like, very clearly, even from, not just on the ground, but from above, like, you are on the loop. Um, I think that's the, the place in the lock scale. But then we, as Kate was saying, picked a lot of small areas where there could be opportunities to create place. Uh, is Mojo or Let Lake a uh, hood river in that it has a lot of part-time residents? You know, hood river has people who go there for vacation, people who are, have second homes or Airbnb kinds of things. And I guess in terms of plan, doing a plan with engagement, you know, how do you think about those people that are part-timers? Who do you know about that? Do you I mean, when the city, the city for being so small has actually done a lot of visioning work. In fact, we were warned of planning fatigue, which I found hilarious considering how small it is. Um, in the past, they've done some direct mail, which we didn't have in our budget for this particular project. But we based, like, we started off making those goals before we even started our own engagement, and we based them on um, things that the community, even very as recently as 2011, had a big EPA funded visioning effort decided were there, uh, what they wanted to see happen in the downtown. And for that, they actually did some direct mail. Um, they used zip, zip codes. Like, they, they had addresses for, for people who were part-time residents. Um, we also emailed our survey around to a lot of community newsletters and also to the Historic Highway, the Columbia, wait, the Historic Columbia River Highway Advisory Committee. It's a long name. Um, and they're all not necessarily based actually in Mosher, and the community newsletter also goes out to people who um, are involved in the town but don't live there. And then also, uh, the Mosher Community School is a, it's officially a charter school. Is it a charter school? It's actually a charter school. It's really fantastic, and a lot of kids go there to live in the South and in Hood River. So we had uh, email campaigns and take-home backpack flyers that went out to all, I think it's uh, 100 some, between 100 and 200 students at the local school that went out to all their parents. Um, so there are people who obviously care about their children's safety and who also might vacation or bike through Mosier. And so we reached them as well. And then locally, we canvassed about 80 homes in Mosier Manor that is the main local community, which is a manufactured home that's right downtown. So we have limited time and resources, but we built off of some efforts that had a further reach. And then we also tried a little bit to include the really local community and then parents at the school and like the advisory committee and you know, we had like almost 70 people on our like, Facebook page. I don't think they were all residents. So um, we did a few things like that. Great. There is one online question about uh, what is, what's the source
course of the rule of 10 for the green loop project, of course, uh, and then uh, could you elaborate on how it should be compiled to the inclusion of the So the source is the project to public spaces, and um, it could be applied. Our recommendations are pretty broad and don't say, in this one block, you need to have these things, but it could be applied that, for example, um, I'm picking up my child from daycare on campus, and at the same time, we're going to stop and grab some food at a food cart, and we're going to pause, and we're going to eat. Um, and while she's having dinner, I'm going to be able to update this report that's due June 8th. And, <laughs> uh, and at the same time, um, I could uh, turn in a library book. Um, I guess now I'm up to five, but this, <laughs> this idea of I was in a different presentation. I did manage to rattle off ten. <laughs> um, I think if you think of like director's park, like you can people watch, you can eat. There's tables that you could, you know, take out some books. There's fountains that you can not only look at but play in. There's chess, so you could be playing chess or you could be watching people play chess. Right. Just spaces like that. It might not necessarily be that you get to ten. But it's it's more than there is a bench here for me to sit on and that's it. Yet another question for the Green Loop Project. Uh, uh, on the elaborating the technique you use to reach out and communicate with the public in the planning process. Um, we uh, relied a lot on our interviews and also survey. For our surveys, we leveraged a lot of existing social media networks. Uh, we reached out to uh, the BTA, to the campus. Um, one group we really tried to target was students because a lot of times in the traditional planning process, students are so transitory, you know, they're here for four years and then they're gone. They're very rarely represented in the planning process. So we reached out to them through the Bike Hub, through uh, the PSU Vanguard, uh, Biking Vanguard, excuse me, um, to really uh, be able to pull them in through our online survey. Uh, that was one of our primary goals. Or one of our primary tools for reaching out to the public. Uh, our stakeholder interviews, we really tried to uh, find people who could speak for multiple groups at multiple times um, to really catch a very broad section of the population. Okay, not before we close, next week we'll have Professor Jennifer Deal to talk about the cycling gender gap. Uh, that uh, let's put our hands together for the for the two teams for a great work and great presentation.